member of the Nipmuc tribe, a local here to Southern New England, and I serve as Associate Director of NACI, which is Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative at Brown University. I joined Brown in summer of 2019, and as you can imagine, it's been a very interesting time. I had an amazing eight months um, helping to build this program, and then of course the almost past year has been spent um, away from campus and all of the amazing people that I work with. Um, so we're, we're working on keeping things going in the virtual world here. So the focus of our office is developing uh, first and foremost an undergraduate concentration in Native American and Indigenous Studies. Uh, we've been working on that very hard. We actually submitted the curriculum for review just this semester uh, about a month ago and we're very, very excited about that and we look forward to providing more updates about that soon. Um, in addition to other things that we do in our office, we have an amazing staff of uh, five plus myself. We provide a lot of programming, um, like this lecture that, that we're having this afternoon. We were fortunate in uh, the tail end of 2019 to have been granted a Mellon Foundation Award, which is helping us to achieve our goals and engage in all of the work that we do, both on campus and in other areas. That includes uh, tribal outreach and helping the university think about a land acknowledgement um, and understanding really what that might mean to local tribes and Brown as well. Um, as I mentioned, we also have a lot of programming with NACE scholars from around the country and the world as we're doing this afternoon. So I welcome you to find our office when we are back on campus. If you're local at 67 George Street, we're on the second floor. It's right off of the main green. Until we can see each other in person again, please find our website. I put that link in the chat box. So uh, please find that. It's, it's ever expanding. We have um, you know, this amazing staff of five, plus myself, as I've mentioned. And uh, we have uh, a lot that is, that is happening here with, with Native Studies at Brown. Um, I also welcome you to find us on Instagram and Facebook and do follow us. And I just wanna say again, welcome. We are so pleased that you could join us this afternoon. And we are so pleased to have Sarah Deer here with us. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Makana Kushi, who serves as our program coordinator and so much more, I must say, who will introduce our speaker this afternoon. Makana. Hello and welcome again, everyone. Um, my name is Makana Fushi. I'm the program coordinator of uh, the initiative working on events planning and student engagement. I'm also a third year PhD student in American studies working on indigenous sovereignty and migrant labor relations in early 20th century Hawaii. And so uh, NACI is so pleased to be hosting Professor Sarah Deer for our presidential lecture. I'm personally really excited about it because I read parts of her book in one of the first Indigenous Studies courses that I ever took as an undergraduate that kind of set me on the path of Indigenous Studies called um, Indigenous Feminisms. And in two weeks, students in the course that I'm teaching um, on Indigenous Resurgence are also reading um, parts of the book too. So I'm super excited about this and encourage them to join us. Um, Please note that we're recording this event uh, and the recording will be available on our website, which we'll send uh, the link to in the chat again, in case anybody has just joined. Um, it should be up in a couple weeks. Uh, just for the structure, uh, this is gonna be a talk for about 45 to 50 minutes. And then we're gonna do a Q and A at the end. Uh, you're welcome to, at that point, unmute and ask your question yourself, or if you want to uh, ask it anonymously or would rather someone else ask it, you can private message your question to me and I'll read it um, aloud. So introducing uh, Professor Deer. So Dr. Sarah Deer is a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, a university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas and Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Her legal scholarship focuses on the challenges facing tribal nations in the United States, particularly criminal justice. The 2015 book, The Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America, is a, is a culmination of over 25 years of working with survivors and criminal justice personnel and has received several awards, including the Best First Book Award from the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. As a tribal jurist and scholar, Justice Deer's scholarship focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights, using indigenous principles as a framework. 
Deer is a co-author of four textbooks on tribal law and has been published in a wide variety of law journals, including the Harvard Journal of Law and Gender, the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism, and the Columbia Journal of Gender and Law. So again, just to note that we're recording uh, this event, everybody, and um, take it away, Professor Deer. Well, thank you very much. You can all hear me, right? It's always good to double check before I start talking. Well, yes. thank you um, very, very much. I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a while. Of course, we had planned uh, an event in, uh, in spring of last year and, and uh, the timing couldn't have been you know, uh, worse for trying to get around the country and share my thoughts. So this is fantastic. And I'm really, really grateful for everyone who's put time and effort over the last almost a year to bring me to Brown. Um, and I know it's not easy to coordinate all of this online um, and it's, uh, we all have some Zoom fatigue. So I really do appreciate everyone who's uh, played a part and, and welcome to all of you. Um, I, um, I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then take questions. Um, I might go a little over because I get excited about this work. Um, but I have a couple disclaimers up front. Um, one is um, that not all tribal nations are the same. And so I may explain something that is applicable to one tribe, but maybe not others. Um, and that I am gonna be talking about sexual violence um, in this presentation. I'm not gonna provide any pictures or you know, graphic information, um, but nonetheless, I know that these kinds of discussions can be very upsetting for people. And that's a natural reaction to, 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 to difficult material, especially if it has touched your life in some way. Um, so be sure to take care of yourself. You know, if you need to log off, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to, to let you give you a heads up about that kind of material. Um, okay, so I wanna start by, um, uh, seeing if I can change my slides. There we go. Um, uh, the, the interesting thing about, about my, my talk today is that it sort of follows the journey of my academic career as well. Um, as I've learned more and developed more um, knowledge about these issues, uh, I sort of walk through that part of my life and connect it to the larger work that we do. Um, so I've divided the talk into four um, parts. And you can see those here. Um, and um, I think another thing that's really important to talk about is the language that we use. Um, what do we talk about Indians or Native Americans or American Indians or First Nations? There's not a consistent agreement among everyone about the appropriate terms um, to use. And I tend to use them interchangeably just so I can reach my audience, right? Um, but uh, not everyone is in agreement about the appropriate use of, of terminology to describe indigenous peoples. That's another one you can use, indigenous. Um, I, uh, I tend, I'm a lawyer <laughs> and, and most of federal Indian law is actually uses the term Indian. So it's like in hundreds of statutes and cases. And so I tend to default to Indian, which is not everybody's favorite term, but that's just sort of how my brain works. Um, so moving forward, I wanna tell you a little bit um, about the crisis in, in um, Indian country um, on reservations and off. Um, it's very, very hard to get data, statistically um, significant data uh, when studying the problems of gendered violence. And part of that is because um, American Indian Alaska Native people um, are only around 2% of the entire population of the United States. Um, and so oftentimes national studies don't get enough American Indian people participating to, to draw any sort of conclusions. Um, but we know from our communities and our elders that this has been a problem for a really long time. The best data that we have today in 2021 is from a report that was actually published by the federal government. It was funded by the federal government. And um, I put a link here um, to the actual PDF. It's a, it's a pretty substantial report um, going into a lot of details. And I'm just gonna pull out a couple of data points that I think will be interesting to you. Um, I will note also that this um, study has a, um, a fatal flaw in that it does not um, address two-spirit LGBTQ uh, native people. So there's, there's, it's man and woman and, and they don't ask 
you know, whether you're gay or straight. So all we have is sort of American Indian and there's a lot of pieces that are missing in that, um, in that sort of overall uh, work. Um, so I wanna pull a couple of quotes from this report to kind of tell you where we are. So um, this comes from the very report, again, from the US Department of Justice. And this is the table that is used to describe how many native women have experienced violence. And um, this is lifetime violence. So over 84% of native women will be victims um, of, of some for form of violence. Um, when we get to the sexual violence issue, we see that more than half of Native women have experienced some form of sexual violence. So we're talking about the highest rates in the nation, and in some cases, um, you know, some of the highest rates in the entire world. And um, when I started learning about this issue, I wanted to, to know the answer, like why? Because I felt like if we can't figure out why these numbers are as high as they are, it's really, really difficult um, to form solutions that are gonna make sense for, for the communities. So um, talking to, to Native people across the country in my travels, um, I, I bring this statistic out and a lot of people who work directly with tribal communities, whether they're on or off reservation, have said, this seems a little low to me based on the, the direct services that I do. Um, so this is sort of the, the minimum that the federal government recognizes, but in some places it, must, it could be much higher uh, than if even this data would suggest. Um, now, the other thing that's really interesting about this report is um, the discussion about interracial violence. Now, most of the time in American law, American criminology, um, in, a, in the United States, we call most personal and violent crime um, intra-racial, uh, in, in, interracial violence. So that means if you're a white victim, statistically, your perpetrator is also white. Right, and um, the same thing with 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 Black Americans. Uh, a Black victim is much more likely to experience violence at the hands of another Black person. Right, the only exception to that rule is Native people. We we tend to be um, more often um, victimized by non-Indians, people who are not part of our part of our categorization of tribe or, or blood quantum or what have you, but we experience higher crime, higher interracial crime than any other population. And that's represented in this um, chart here. You see the 97% and 90%. Um, those are victims that reported that they had at least one non-native perpetrator in, in their life experience. Now, this is not to say that native people don't hurt each other. I mean, absolutely, um, there is native on native crime. Um, but this is unique, this, this interracial um, component and kind of I'll be teasing that out as we go along um, to try to figure out where, why this is happening and, and what we can do to try to address it. Now, like I said, the report, the big report from the feds from, from 2016 does not carve out um, questions around um, gender identity, um, two-spirit people, LGBTQ people. So I've had to look at some smaller studies in order to try to understand whether or not, you know, the, the, the statistics are similar since the federal government hasn't really asked that question. So I pulled a couple of, or three, I guess, um, examples of local studies done, um, you know, through research maybe locally to, to find out some of these numbers. And of course, these are also horrifying as well. Um, uh, over 80 for 80, in one study in 2017, over 84% of two-spirit people reported experiencing bi biased related victimization. Um, I just realized I didn't really explain what two-spirit refers to. So um, it's you could write a whole book on what two-spirit means. Um, but two-spirit generally references uh, an umbrella concept that Native people share um, with each other uh, to distinguish them from uh, sort of the larger LGBTQ community. Um, not everyone who is uh, a native LGBTQ person uses the term two-spirit, but many do. And that's why I try to try to recognize both of those, um, uh, both of those uh, identifiers. So what we need is we need a national study 
um, to look at the issues facing Native Two-Spirit people so that we can get a better handle on what's needed in the community. Because it's all solution-based. We can put up every single number in the world, but it doesn't matter if we don't follow it up with some action. So um, that's, that's one of the reasons I really value studies um, is because they push us, they push us um, to make uh, uh, policy changes that are going to help people in need. So I wanna go back in time a little bit here and talk about um, tribal nations in general. So um, tribal nations have been um, on this continent in the United States. I don't know if we have any international viewers, um, but uh, um, we were here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before um, a contact with Europeans. And so we wanna kind of think about that because there's a, a, a sort of a stigma or maybe a stereotype out there that you know, tribe, tribes didn't really have governments or courts or they didn't really operate like a civilized nation. And so I'd like to counter that a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of our, and it's hard to, to, you know, zero in on this. And again, not every tribe is the same. So here are some common themes though that I have discovered in my research. Um, tribal nations tended to really not have so much a criminal law system as a system of restitution. So if a victim came forward in a tribal community, um, most of the time tribal nations goal uh, in the aftermath of that violence would be to uh, provide the, the, the um, restitution to the victim and the family and maybe the clan. Um, and, and so it was very different than maybe what we expect in the contemporary setting when it comes to sexual assault. We also had a lot of tribal nations, and again, there's major exceptions, that um, are and continue to be uh, matrilineal. I hesitate to use the word matriarchy only because I don't, I don't think I've discovered anything that suggests that women ruled over men. If anything, it was sort of a, uh, egalitarian systems that we operated with. Matrilineal refers to the, the identity of a child uh, and their lineage. And um, the, a lot of tribal communities, including my own, you, um, you take on the uh, lineage of your mother uh, rather than your father. So, you know, in mainstream white America, we typically see the name of the last name of the father being the surname of the child is sort of the opposite for a lot of our tribal nations. So, you know, things were different things, you know, things that Europeans were doing, we weren't necessarily doing those things here. Um, and so when I started thinking about these numbers, and this takes me back to my student years um, as a law student, um, I wanted to write, I was taking federal Indian law for the first time, and I didn't grow up on a reservation. I grew up in an urban setting um, in Kansas, if there is such a thing, in Wichita. And so I didn't have a lot of knowledge um, about Creek history, Muscogee you know, government, governance, um, and so I decided I really wanted to write a paper for federal Indian law that would allow me to do that research and discover uh, what exactly happened to create this crisis. Um, and so one of the things I found were the journals of William Bartram, who was a white, um, a, sort of an eccentric character uh, in the late 18th century. And he uh, was among other things, sort of a botanist self-taught and he decided to travel down to the southeastern part of the United States and begin drawing and naming plants and animals. And he lived um, down there for about 10 years doing this work and he wrote lots of journals and lots of letters and lots of questions came to him from his friends. Um, and, and he lived among the Creek and Cherokee people. So we we're neighbors and he came down and lived um, and, and worked near and within uh, a tribal communities down there. And several times in his journal, you know, he, he remarks uh, that the gender relationships seem to be very different than the European type relationships that he had, of course, seen in his youth and growing up. Um, but I thought this was a really powerful thing to pull out. I never saw or heard of an instance of an Indian beating his wife or other female. Uh, and that was, um, that was surprising to him. You know, that was something that he hadn't encountered before. So I like to bring that out again to show that, you know, we have this really, really high, high rate of violence today, but it wasn't always like that. You know, there were, there were, were cultural sanctions, there were spiritual sanctions, um, there were ways to hold people accountable. And as a result, um, crime, you know, like domestic violence was, was pretty rare. 
Um, so I like to share that because I discovered it in law school and I don't have a lot of students on the call today. Uh, don't forget something you could be doing just for a paper for a class could end up being your career. And that's exactly what, what happened for me. The other thing that I found in my studies was the first rape law that my people wrote down. So we didn't have a written language and Muscogee people didn't have a written language until um, about uh, uh, the 1840s. So we were an oral, we, everything was oral. We had oral laws, we had traditions that were all passed down orally. We didn't have an alphabet. We didn't have any way to write down uh, our laws. And then after removal um, to Indian territory, missionaries and uh, Creek elders work together to create an alphabet and create a system of writing. But we didn't have that yet in 1824. Um, and the reason we wrote down these laws or one particular you know, person wrote down these laws is because we were told by the federal government that if we wanted to be treated as, as a civilized people, that we had to sort of mimic the, the white type of governments. So they said, the, the Creek agent, the federal agent said, if you are a legitimate government, you have to have written laws. So with, we you know, acquiesced to that for, for the sake of survival and the sake of being, of being uh, treated as a civilized people. So um, this law uh, came to my attention when I was doing some archival research. And a lot of the laws from this 1824 list, there's a, a list, I think it's 54 laws, um, was this because most of the other laws really looked a lot like what you would see in the state codes. You know, they were they were assimilated. You know, they were they, we had assimilated um, quite early to Christianity and English and that kind of thing. But somehow this phrase, this what she say it be law, um, it really jumps out at me because unlike the other laws that I looked at, this is something that was completely different. Um, from anything I saw in any kind of state law at this time period. So um, obviously it's a very gendered law. So not suggesting that we sort of re bring this back, you know, and, and use it today. Uh, but it is interesting to think about that despite everything that, that was happening to us, um, we still held on to this um, idea that, you know, the, the agency of a victim, um, the agency of a survivor to be involved in determining what should happen to the person that raped them. Um, and, you know, we still struggle with that today. You know, we do have victims' rights laws and victim impact statements, um, but it's pretty clear in this rape law that uh, the, the victim was the primary consultant on the appropriate sanctions for that kind of behavior. So again, real distinction from what we see in the Western uh, or Euro-American world. So, then my research question for life um, uh, is, you know, what, what factors can explain this difference? We went from low rates of violence to very high rates of violence. So how did that happen and what can we do to address it? Um, so I start out with this term sovereignty and the, the title of my talk today is Sovereignty of the Soul. Um, sovereignty is not a particularly complicated concept. Um, it sounds complex, but it's really just the ability of a government to make laws. And, and then govern themselves accordingly, right? Um, so when we think about a state, so I'm in the state of Kansas right now, um, no one really talks about Kansas sovereignty because it's sort of taken as a given um, that Kansas has laws and governs themselves accordingly. Um, and same thing with the federal government, right? They same idea. So you don't hear the term a lot, but when it comes to tribal nations, we have really struggled to hold on to sovereignty. And that's one of the concepts I think is really important to understand is the connection between safety and sovereignty. So when I started thinking, when I started learning more about this history, I thought, you know, I'd been a rape crisis counselor for quite a while at that point and, um, and had been doing direct services uh, with women for six, six or seven years at the time. And, and so I started thinking about sovereignty in another way, sovereignty of the individual, sovereignty over our own bodies. And there's a real parallel there, right? Because the idea is that if you know a, a, a human being should get to make the decisions about what happens to them, what happens to their bodies. And um, when, when the, there's gendered violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, 
hate crimes, that individual sovereignty is violated, right? Somebody else uh, made the decision about what was going to happen to your body. And so I started seeing this as sort of a parallel, right? We have tribes that are really struggling with sovereignty, and we have individuals who are really struggling with trauma. Um, and so that's why I call the talk sovereignty of the soul, kind of to try to bridge the divide there um, between um, tribes and, and people. So the problem that we, were, that we really have, which is um, the, um, the sovereignty fight, is that the systems that we had in place were dissolved or banned or you know, excommunicated, that we were expected to adopt Euro-American styles of government and, uh, and practice Christianity and do the things that would prove that we were able to, to, to govern ourselves. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the laws that have been passed that have really diminished the ability of tribal nations to govern themselves and protect their own communities. So I'm gonna go through a few um, statutes and laws um, as we go along here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about federal policy first. So there's sort of, you have the actual black letter law, which is your statutes and your cases, but you also have federal policy, um, which is made by, um, by the executive branch by and large. And so um, most people have heard of the Trail of Tears, um, oftentimes in the context of uh, the Cherokee Nation in particular is probably the most well-known, but there were five tribal, tribal nations that were actually removed um, to what was supposed to be Indian territory here on the, in the darker red on the left side of the screen. Uh, that's where we landed and that's where we were, we were told we, we would stay. Um, we didn't go willingly. It was a forced march and we lost um, around 4,000 people. Um, at least the, the Creek, my people um, lost about 4,000 on the journey because we were on foot and we had elders and babies that were very fragile. And so, you know, we had to bury them and, um, and keep going. So the reason I bring this up here is because a lot of federal policy um, is um, um, laden with sexual assault um, overtones, so or undertones. What's happening here is these red lines all convey a trail. So there's not just one trail of tears, there's many trails of tears. Um, but at any rate, um, we had no government to turn to in this time period. This is the 1830s, I should have mentioned that, uh, 1830s. And um, so what would happen is that the military, um, and we were marched you know, in, in, at Bayonet Point by the military to the West, um, is that they were also you know, committing sexual assault against native women. Um, oftentimes at night when they stopped to sleep for the evening, native women would be taken away from their camp and sexually assaulted and returned to their, uh, their family in the morning. Uh, this happened quite a bit. You see a lot of this in the missionary records because a lot of missionaries accompanied these tribes um, and saw for themselves what was happening. So uh, when we think about the Trail of Tears and we think about all kinds of other removal, I mean, the Trail of Tears is the most well-known, but most tribes at one point or another have been forced to leave where they're from and go somewhere else because that's the you know that's what they've decided, but the sexual assault part of it doesn't often get discussed as much as it should. Um, there were there were removals in the Southwest as well. Um, this is some picture of this is a painful picture for me. It's um, a picture of Diné or Navajo women uh, in the 1860s when they were being held captive um, and after a forced march. And um, we don't know much about the picture. We don't know who took it. We don't know exactly when it was taken and we don't know who these people are. Um, but I would, uh, as someone who's worked with traumatized victims for a very, very long time, I think there's something else going on here besides fear, hunger, uh, and, and, and fatigue. Um, I have to wonder what, what is going on behind the scenes um, when you look at these faces. So the other thing, another policy, of course, is, is the loss of land. Um, you know, tribal nations have been forced to treat, um, to, to give up their lands. Lands have been just stolen outright. Um, and so 
Uh, a lot of people, when they think about that, they don't think about the impact then on, on what would that mean for sexual assault survivors. Well, a lot of tribal cultures and religious and spiritual beliefs are tied to a specific place on the land, right? So it's a, it might be a river, it might be a cliff, it might be a, a rock, um, a, a, you know, a, a, like a, um, I think Devil's Tower is one that I think of a lot, um, that were these sacred spaces, which is where you would go to pray if you've been traumatized or if you know someone who's been traumatized. And so when we lose land, we lose access to some of those sacred sites. And for, for many tribal um, uh, belief systems, um, you can't just go somewhere else and like build a church and then, and then work, use that. It, it's tied to that land space where people go to pray. And so imagine being a traumatized person and not being able to even go where your ancestors went when they had times of sorrow as well. So I like to point that out, that even if it doesn't look like there's sexual assault there, there is an impact on the victims. <clears throat> the other challenging thing we um, got uh, uh, that I learned about um, was the boarding school era. So it became very expensive in the late 19th century. Congress actually had debates about how expensive it was to kill Indians, because that was really the, the strategy at that time. And it was becoming very expensive. And so um, Congress worked with some, um, some, some folks to develop these boarding school systems, which were designed to brainwash native children. Um, and they took children without permission. They took them sometimes thousands of miles away and um, cut their hair, made them speak English, made them practice Christianity. If they did anything that was remotely considered Indian or pagan or heathen, um, then they were beaten for that. And so this picture is a before picture. This is some Apache children um, uh, in, um, I can't remember what year this was, but I'll, I'll find that. Um, but these are, these are Apache children that were rounded up by the military to be taken to Pennsylvania. So we're talking about South, the Southwest where the Apaches are from, moving all the way, taking these children all the way to Pennsylvania, right? And they didn't know what was happening half the time. So what happened was this not only just like mental brainwashing, but, but physical um, appearances also. So this is the same exact group of children um, as you saw in the last picture. So I'll do the before again, um, there we go. This is the before and this is the after. So you can see a stark change in the way, um, the way they're dressed and the way they're, they're sitting. Um, the other thing that's going on, of course, in addition to brainwashing, is the sexual abuse that comes along with having unfettered access to children and nobody to be held accountable by. So a lot of boarding schools can, were experiencing very high rates of sexual assault against both boys and girls um, in these boarding schools. Not every boarding school had this problem, but it was pretty systemic. And the boarding school era in the United States really didn't end officially until the 1960s, 1970s is when they, they started to change that, um, change that up a little bit. So um, again, what I'm doing here is I'm just walking you through how some of the federal policies um, actually institutionalize sexual violence in the lives of, of Native people. Skip ahead here. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the laws because um, that's my thing. I'm a lawyer, and so I want to talk to you about three important, two important statutes and one important Supreme Court case. And this is where you start to see tribal sovereignty under attack, so that tribal nations where before they could handle a rape case or they could handle a homicide case, now they're being told, no, you can't do that. You're, you no longer have the right to do that. So I want to start out with the um, Major Crimes Act, which was a statute passed by Congress in 1885. And it was a response to a homicide case in the Dakota territories. So on the left part of your screen, this is a, a chief um, named uh, uh, Crow, Crow Dog um, was his name. And on the right is Spotted Tail. And they were um, of the same people, but they didn't necessarily see eye to eye. 
They had different philosophies about what was going to be best for the future. Um, Crow Dog would probably be considered more of a radical, um, no, you know, no cooperation with the federal government. Whereas Spotted Tail um, was a little bit more interested in seeing how things could work and sent, actually sent his children to school. So at any rate, there's a lot of stories about what, what went on with these two men. Um, but at the end of the day, Crow Dog shot and killed Spotted Tail, killed him maybe with the gun he's holding in that picture right there. So it was a homicide case, it was a murder case. And um, the tribe dealt with that because they had a government, they had a system. Didn't look anything like the white system, but it was a system that worked for them. And in this particular case, the story goes that um, Crow Dog was, we didn't have prisons or jails. So we didn't know what that, we had never been exposed to something like that. So again, with the victim restitution idea is that Crow Dog was found to be guilty um, and his punishment was providing for, for the extended family of Spotted Tail, material goods um, and the like to make sure that Spotted Tail's family would be taken care of for the rest of their lives. So that was the punishment. Now that didn't go well with federal agents and, and white folks in this area because they saw Crow Dog as an enemy Indian and they were horrified that they saw him, what they thought was walk, you know, just get um, freedom from um, without really any, what they saw as due process. So the federal government decided to prosecute him and put, brought him into federal court. And he, and he had a very good lawyer and their argument was, well, wait a second, this is our land and we have a government why is another government, you know, foreign government essentially coming in and adjudicating crime in our community? Um, that wouldn't work like if France decided to come prosecute something in the United States. I was like, where do you get the right to do that? And that was exactly what Crow Dog argued. And it made it all the way to the US Supreme Court where he actually won his case. Um, and that's because the Supreme Court, they weren't particularly fond of Indians. There's a lot of racist language in those cases, but they did say, well, he has a point. They are an individual set aside government with their own governmental powers and structures. Um, and so given the state of things, uh, Crow Dog was held accountable and the white system cannot, uh, cannot do that. Um, so he was released and he, um, he we went on to, to lead a long life. So Congress was of course horrified as well because Again, you know, we've got a renegade Indian or a radical. And so they decided to pass a law, a, a congressional statute that would allow the federal government to prosecute in the future. Um, so uh, the Major Crimes Act came just three years, no, two years after the, the Supreme Court case. And Congress passed a law that authorized federal criminal jurisdiction over crimes committed by Indians in Indian country um, without any consultation with the tribes. So a lot of what you see in Indian law is decisions being made for tribes without any input from the tribes. And so that's the challenge in practicing Indian law today. Um, it's still good law. It's still on the books um, and it's used every day. So what that means is that on most of the reservations in the, in the lower 48, um, the response to a crime like homicide or sexual violence um, doesn't come from um, the, the, the basically federal government, the FBI and the US attorneys. So we don't really think about crime being resolved in those federal courts. They're usually done in state courts um, if you have a crime happen, but because Congress acted and Congress has the power to decide um, or has given themselves the power to decide what happens um, in tribal communities, we have this law that's still on the books. Now tribes can also still prosecute, but I'll have a caveat to that in just a moment. Um, so this is still good law. And what it means now is that um, all throughout the, the 20th century and today, if there is a serious felony level crime, um, the federal government can just come in and take over the investigation and they can take over the prosecution and they don't have to consult with the tribes on their actions. So it's that idea like, okay, we have a foreign government making decisions about our people. Um, why can't we make, make those same decisions? So a sexual assault victim, instead of finding herself in tribal court or state court is gonna find that she's now in, in federal court and I'm trying to seek justice. 
The second law that I want to talk about comes um, almost uh, 80 years later in 1968. And in this law, it was a very long law that you could do a whole semester on. But the important thing for you to know is that tribal nations have um, a limitation on the sentencing authority. Uh, Congress has capped the sentencing authority uh, tribes to a maximum of one year or a $5,000 fine or both. So you're thinking about a crime like sexual violence and you're thinking about one year. And for a lot of people, that doesn't seem like enough time. Um, there's also an ongoing debate in Indian country as there is uh, uh, all over the, the, the nation about uh, carceral solutions to violent crime and whether that's the right uh, method to, to deal with these kinds of crimes. But at any rate, the state courts, no, it doesn't matter what the crime is. A tribe could prosecute a homicide, but they would be limited to a one-year sentence. And so for that reason, a lot of times the tribes will sort of defer to the federal prosecutors because the federal prosecutors don't have that same limitation um, to one year. They can sentence you know, for a very long time. So that was another attack on our sovereignty, right? And then finally, um, the, the last um, law I wanna to talk to you is actually a Supreme Court case called Oliphant versus Suquamish from 1978. This was a case that started in Washington state with a very small tribe called the Suquamish tribe. And they sought to prosecute two white men who had um, who lived on the reservation, but had engaged in some some sort of drunkenly disorderly conduct and had punched a tribal cop and and done you know some not 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 serious but you know it was, it was fairly mild kind of crimes. Nobody was significantly hurt. So the tribe prosecuted them for breaking their laws, and the defendants took it all the way to Supreme Court, and they won. And the Supreme Court said tribal nations can no longer um, exert criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So remember the statistics that I showed at the beginning about the high rate of interracial crime experienced by Native people, both men and women. And can we blame Oliphant for that? Because if a, if a non-Native person commits an act of violence against a tribal member on a reservation, tribe doesn't have authority. They have to depend on the feds or the, in some cases the state to take these cases. So this may be part of the explanation as to why the interracial crime rate is so high for native people. So we're trying to get this back and we're having some success. We're trying to get our criminal jurisdiction restored. Um, I'm going a little over time here, but I want to tell you um, uh, so um, uh, kind of what we've been doing to address all these problems. And so the rest of our presentation is a little more positive um, to tell you what activists have been doing, what scholars have been doing, um, and how we've been trying to push back and regain the sovereignty so that we can protect our own people on our own terms. So by the end of the 20th century, I guess, um, you know, we, we have uh, limitations of only prosecuting members of tribes, um, the limit on sentencing authority, and then of course, poverty. Um, it's an extremely expensive endeavor to, uh, a pro to, to have a criminal justice system. It's one of the most expensive things that governments do is prosecute. It's just um, incredibly expensive. So there are a lot of tribes out there that really have not developed um, a contemporary uh, justice system just out of sheer poverty. Um, some tribes will um, use their traditional ways of dispute resolution, um, but it, in terms of sort of a Western prosecution, we're pretty limited in what we can do to protect our own people. Um, so one of the laws that we got passed was called the Tribal Law and Order Act, and it was an Obama administration um, uh, directive. And... Um, the, uh, the what this what this law did it was a really big piece of legislation you know it's one of those big thick um, legislation, and what it did is it did a lot of things to help the federal government be, be more responsive to victims in Indian country, but it also changed the sentencing cap from one year to three years, um, and so before we could only sentence to one year now we can only sentence to three years, and believe me that was a fight. And people go, why three years? Why not 10? I'm like, I, because that's all we could get done. That's all that we were able to, to, to manage to, to compromise on that. 
So that was a step in the right direction. And then we had the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which is, of course, um, originally um, a Biden effort in the 1990s. And um, we amended it um, to include jurisdiction over non-Indians. And that was a fight, a really, really brutal fight. Um, but we had to compromise. Um, Congress said, we will allow you to prosecute non-Indians um, if it's a domestic violence type case. So if it's somebody who's married uh, a tribal member, someone who has a baby with a tribal member, um, some form of domestic partnership, uh, those kinds of cases can be prosecuted by uh, tribal courts now. Um, not, not very many tribes are doing it yet because there's a lot of things that have to be in place, um, but that was a huge victory. And now we're going back for more. Um, the next Violence Against Women Act, we're gonna add sexual assault, child abuse, and assault on a police officer so that we can better protect um, our own communities. So the other thing we do is we, we, take, we participate in some Supreme Court cases that um, uh, have an impact on, on victims in Indian country. So we file amicus briefs, which are briefs um, that aren't really directly involving the parties at, at, who, are, who are, you know, fighting each other, but a, a brief to let the court know your decision is going to impact other people in this way. And so that's what we did. In Mississippi, um, there's one tribe, uh, one federally recognized tribe called the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, and they had a Dollar General store on the reservation. A Mississippi band is a fairly wealthy tribe. Um, I, part of that is because um, they have a, a gaming in an area where there's not much other gaming going on. Um, but they had an incident where a child was molested, a, a Choctaw child was molested by the um, operator, or the manager at Dollar General. Um, and he was a white man. And the child was in the store as a part of uh, a program for youth, a summer program for youth to learn about different kinds of jobs and go behind the scenes in a Dollar General store and learn what stocking is and just giving the kids, you know, some, some job skills that they could use going forward. Well, this child's molested in this process. And so, um, of course, um, the tribe couldn't prosecute him because he's white. So, uh, but he was banished from the reservation. So he was, he, he's not back there. But um, so because the federal government decided not to prosecute this case because there was no penetration, and that's what their threshold is, the parents of this little boy uh, filed a lawsuit, like a civil personal injury lawsuit in tribal court to get some compensation for their, their child, their victim for counseling bills, medical bills, and all of those kinds of things. So they sued Dollar General in tribal court. And Dollar General, which is a huge corporation, um, fought back and they said, you know what? No, we're not going to tribal court. That, that, that's not right. Um, you know, we don't, we don't make the laws here, you know, um, so it's not fair. And they took that all the way to the Supreme Court and they lost um, almost every, um, at every level, the Dollar General lost. They spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to try to keep the system in place that a non-Indian or a non-Indian entity would, could never be held accountable by a tribe, no matter what they did. Um, so it was a big case if you think about victims' rights, right? Not being able to, not only can you not prosecute your, your, acute, your abuser, but now you can't even sue him. Um, and so we fought very, very hard to make sure that the, the, the system worked and that we got the um, right outcome for this. Um, and so we wrote this brief. This is the first one that we worked on. And I work on this with Mary Catherine Nagel, who's a Cherokee attorney. Um, and we filed a brief in this case, trying to explain to the court um, how dire the situation is and how important it was for the tribe to be able to protect its own people, if not through criminal law, at least through civil law. Um, so um, we filed those briefs and we had activism outside the Supreme Court. And we ended up with a tie vote in the Supreme Court. Uh, it was eight, there were eight justices at this time because Justice Scalia had passed away during that year. And so before that seat was filled, we had a 4-4 uh, tie in uh, Dollar General. So you can see we were one vote away from losing civil authority in addition to already have lo having lost um, criminal authority. 
We've continued to file briefs in other cases that have been making the news. Um, and I can't say we won, but the briefs that we filed ended up being on the side of the victor in these, in these cases. And so we're just keeping our eye on the Supreme Court so that we can protect what we have. So you've got sort of two prongs. You're dealing with the federal the Congress on the one hand, and then you're dealing with the courts on the other hand, and trying to fight for everything we can uh, so that we can make a dent in these crime rates. They're just astronomical. Um, so that is my presentation, and I thank you very much for um, coming to a virtual uh, lecture. This is the cover of my book, um, Beginning and End of Rape, and I'm working on another book, but it won't be out for a couple of years, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> and if you need to reach me, um, I have my email address here as well as my website. So again, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. That was amazing. Oh my God, I learned so much. Um, I think if you stop sharing your screen now, we can get the grid back up. Um, this is new for all of us as well. The There we go. So we, we have all of our participants. Wonderful. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah, if anybody is comfortable turning their, their screens off, we, we have some time with Dr. Deer to, you know, talk about, um, you know, her talk. And um, I don't know if, um, I know Makana, I, I have a question, but I want to defer to, to anyone else here who, who has a question. And um, Makana is, is going to go ahead and facilitate a Q&A. We have the option to put some questions in the chat or we can unmute. Yeah, well, just to start off, I um, got an uh, anonymous question in the chat that we can start off with as people are turning their cameras on and um, uh, getting the wheels turning. So this person asks, what does it mean to fight to extend the possibilities of tribal nation sentencing from one to three years in the face of broad calls for prison abolition? Yeah, this is the one I'm working on really hard. Um, we, we never had, there's, I, I'm not an archeologist, but from what I understand, there was no conception or, or anything resembling a jail or prison system, right? Um, prior to contact with Europeans. We had harsh punishments, don't get me wrong. I mean, you could be executed for crimes in tribal nations, um, but of course you could be executed for crimes in Europe too. So, you know, it's not, sometimes people say, oh, they were, you know, savages doing these things and you know, torturing people and, you know, in, in, uh, in, in England. Um, but um, yeah, this is a hard question for me because I started out as a, um, a, uh, a rape victim advocate and then um, went on to study law with the goal of being a sex crimes prosecutor. And so this has been a challenging few years for me as I try to think about options that we might have that don't mimic the worst traits of the American uh, mass incarceration. And I, I've talked, I'm doing a study right now where I've talked to over 50 Native women who've survived sexual assault. And I've asked them, each one of them, um, if you had your, if you were the one making the decision, what would you want to see happen in your case? And some of them did do, often say long term incarceration because he's dangerous to children and he has molested 10 children and I think he should go to jail. And then there are other um, survivors who feel differently about it. They're like, jail is not gonna fix it. Jail is gonna make it worse. Um, and so as I'm trying to, trying to calibrate sort of what we might be able to come up with, and a lot of tribes probably already have come up with solutions, but they don't, you know, they're not academics, they don't publish it and give everyone their business. But um, we have, we have only really had jails in Indian country for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And I wonder if there is a way that we can conceptualize um, safety um, through more traditional ways of, um, of, of helping people who have, who have harmed and also have been harmed. So my tribal nation right now does not have a jail. Um, if there is a, a, an incident where someone needs to be incarcerated, we actually rent 
bed space at the local community jails. And of course, Native people suffer greatly um, when they're, they're incarcerated by a white government. So we've been talking about this and talking about a better option, not just build a jail because we can, um, but what it would look like, a long-term therapeutic system, um, which would include traditional um, activities, um, ceremonies, uh, language skills, um, uh, bring in there a lot of, a lot of people are, are, are churchgoers and a lot of people are ceremonial uh, people. Um, there's kind of a, a divide there, but to provide those kinds of services to people who um, have struggled and have ended up causing harm. So it would still, I don't know if it, what we would call it because it still sounds sort of like a jail, like it's an inpatient facility or something, but could we infuse that kind of system with our traditional ways of thinking about how people should interact with each other. Um, and so that's kind of where I am. And I have, it's too early in my study. I haven't started coding in depth yet to see if there's any particular trends, but I can tell you that the fifth from the 50 women that I've interviewed, um, uh, it, it runs the span from lock them up, throw away the key, to hug it out with grandma, right? So there, it's, it's gonna be really difficult, I think, as we start to push back on this idea like warehousing native men is not working and never has. Um, but what that's, what that's gonna look like is gonna be different in every community. So thank you for that question. It's the hardest one for me to answer. You have other questions, Makata, or can I jump in? Um, none so far, but again, if you wanna ask something anonymously, you can send it to me privately and I'll read it. Um, so you had early on talked about action and you, you mentioned it in the context of, of policy, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've done some amazing work like those cases that you mentioned towards the tail end of your talk. And I'm wondering if we could maybe think more, or I'm sure you have thought more about what this action might look like. I'm constantly thinking about action that we could take, right? right. As opposed to just, you know, thinking and, and talking. Um, you know, and what this restitution, could this restitution be, be, be part of this? You, you're talking about restitution um, and what that might look like if the American societal structure in general could get their heads around it, because clearly that has to be part of the equation. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I really like to challenge people who you know, are new to learning about tribal issues um, to think about, um, oh, could you repeat the question? I think I just lost my train. It, it was broadly just like what would what would more action look like to kind uh, of address these issues? Like you know, what actions could we take as a society? Maybe as a society, yeah. Well, I don't think there's any reason why um, non-native governments can't learn from native governments. It's kind of been the opposite. It's always been uh, assimilate. You know, use our system. It's awesome. Um, we lock people up, it's great, you know, and, and, and sort of imposing that ideology on tribal, uh, tribal citizens. And so um, I think that like, I'm working with my tribe right now to write a better sexual assault code that's more inclusive. Um, and in doing so, we can bring in some of those traditional tenants. I said, there's no reason why our nation, Muscogee Creek Nation cannot have the best response to rape in the world. There's no reason that we, we we can't do that. I mean, I'm kind of I'm kind of hopeful. <laughs> I, I want to believe that, you know. And, and if we are able to develop systems that don't mimic the worst traits of Western law and order, um, maybe some states could take you know a, a, a ideas from us. Um, so yeah, so that's something I think about a lot. Is that it's usually people think the tribes are learning from the states how to how to do government, and in fact, I think we might want to look at the reverse. Thanks for that. So, so we in our actions can serve as models, I think, very much so. As what? Another question, McCona. I think I saw one come up in the chat. Yeah, um, also I see Whitney, your hand is raised. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Professor Deer. I really enjoyed it. Um, your topic is actually um, intersectional for something that I work on around environmental justice. Mm -hmm. um, in Minnesota, um, there's a pipeline that's proposed to go through our state that's been approved. But what we're seeing is that an environmental justice issue is also about uh, community safety and women's safety. Um, 
And so we have the same issue that you're describing, like people disappear, women disappearing, they're murdered, they're gone, like there's no accountability. And so what I keep thinking a lot about and, and all of those issues mixed up is there's so much related to honoring treaties. And so I'm really curious about how um, that has shown up in your work and what you see the role of, of that. Um, some of the, as you know, like some of the tribal nations or communities here, um, some are considered communities because they're actually like anti-Dakota laws, for example. And so I'm curious about one, the role of treaties, and two, if there's an effort to get some of the, the anti-Dakota laws in particular off of our, I, I don't know, off of the state books. I'm curious about that. Yeah, um, that's a great, uh, really complicated question. I lived in Minnesota until about three years ago, um, and I'm the chief justice at Prairie Island, so I still have a lot of connections there in Minnesota. I am not an environmental expert, but I do think there is definitely a, a connection. Um, the man camps are what we often talk about when you're going to start fracking. I don't know even the verbiage of environmental law, but if you're going to start fracking or start digging or start, you know, pulling, pulling oil out of the ground, um, what happens is you need a lot of labor in a really short amount of time. And so uh, it's usually men, you know, who don't really have anywhere else to go and get a job working on the pipeline. Um, and uh, they set up these sort of almost shanty towns like mobile homes and even some high end tents and things like that. Um, and, co and coming with that has come a great deal of violence against native people in general. Um, and they can't be held accountable by the tribe because they're not Indian. Uh, and of course, some, some women have been assaulted off reservation where it wouldn't matter. The, the hard part about this is that it's completely constitutional for, according to the US, completely constitutional to violate a treaty, right? So that was decided back in, well, again, it was probably the 1880s, I'm thinking, where um, a, a treaty right was broken and somebody challenged it, took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, yeah, Congress can abrogate a treaty. They don't have to, they don't have to provide any justification for it. So, um, so they can be broken, but if they're not broken, then we try, you can try to litigate them. Litigating treaty rights is very, very difficult because of, of that reason, you know, um, Congress can abrogate them. But the, 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 the key to winning these kinds of cases that is, if Congress is going to do something that may cause harm to the tribe or the land where the tribe is, um, then um, uh, you can try to build a case around that. They have to be explicit. If they're going to do away with the treaty or they're going to um, impose uh, new restrictions, it has to be explicit. So the court doesn't allow um, you know, somebody to just come up and say, well, we think that the treaty is, is no longer valid by inference, right? Just because it seems like it, it's broken. But, um, but if they haven't explicitly done that, then we retain treaty rights. And they're, they're just very hard cases to win. Um, my tribe won a treaty case in July. So I'm kind of still riding a high from that because it's so unusual for tribes to win a treaty case in the Supreme Court. I don't even remember the last time it happened, uh, but it happened this last summer. So um, yes, um, with this environmental degradation, it, it is accompanied um, by high rates of sexual violence and high rates of women that go missing and girls that go missing um, in, in the context of these um, oil companies doing their thing. So I hope that's helpful. We have, oh, we have uh, four different questions from the chat. Um, I will do kind of a roundup. Maybe I'll give you the first two and then give you the second two. Um, sure. So the first one was from uh, Professor Purcell um, asking, can you compare and contrast issues of sexual violence in the US and Canada, particularly around the uh, issue of missing women? And then um, another question, this is kind of a big question, uh, what would it take for the US government to acknowledge tribal sovereignty? And I think this is kind of um, similar to your answer to um, yeah. Rick Gold's question. Okay. so. Um, I can't, you know, claim to be a, a scholar of Canadian Indian history, but 
Um, basically everything that happened here in the United States happened in some form or another in Canada as well. And so we have high, high rates of this kind of violence in Canada. Um, and it's largely, I think, fueled by the same colonial, you know, project is to make Indians and go away, disappear, and not be around anymore. Um, and so when we talk about the context in which women, Native women go missing or whether there's a, a cold case, which is one of the things that a lot of us are concerned about is that she went missing 10 years ago, and nobody's even working the case anymore. And we need cold case experts to come in and help us. But um, actually Canadian First Nation and scholars and activists uh, had been doing this already, had been doing the MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, for quite a while. Uh, uh, <laughs> going back 20 years or so. And we just started looking at it systemically in the United States about five years ago. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, and so I think the factors are very similar. The, um, the context is very similar. And uh, I think that, you know, I know there's a lot of First Nations and Native communities in the United States that collaborate and, and work together on these issues, but there needs to be more. And we in the United States have, you know, if I study what's happened with MMIW issues in Canada, that helps inform kind of the policy proposals that I might make. Um, and we can also learn from mistakes, like, you know, this strategy just didn't work. Um, and so we can benefit from that if we're in communication with our First Nations relatives in Canada. Um, in terms of the second question about what could the government do, <laughs> you want my wish list, it'll take about three hours, but <clears throat> I would like to see a full repudiation of Oliphant. I think that tribes should be able to prosecute any crime that happens in their territory, just like every other state does in the United States. Um, there is some um, talk about reinstituting treaty relationships and re renegotiating treaties. <clears throat> the House of Representatives in 1871 said, we're not signing any more treaties. They just said that, and that became the norm. And so um, the, the fantasy, an idea that I hope will maybe prove, prove possible someday is to treat again um, with between tribes and um, the United States to demand what's needed, to come up with a plan that's gonna work. Because one of the problems with federal Indian law, it treats all Indians the same. Like it doesn't matter, you know, kind of what community you come from, whether you come from the largest tribe or the smallest tribe, there's one federal policy and it makes no sense. So the idea of opening up treaty making again and allowing for a customized relationship between the tribe and the federal government, I think is not a bad idea. I don't know if it has legs, but um, there's no reason, if how the house said we're not gonna sign any more treaties, well, they also have the power to say, we'll start signing treaties again. And that would allow tribal nations to have that government to government relationship where tribes can come to the table and say, this is what we're asking for. And we're gonna to negotiate to make sure that our, our position is clear. So that's a, that's a fantasy um, that may come true. I don't know. Okay, the next two questions from the chat. Um, the first one, uh, reads, in some of our tribes, there were women's laws and the violation of those laws were decided by the women or the clan. Uh, could you speak a little more about this and your thoughts about integrating traditional forms of governance? So that's the first one. And okay. then the second one um, was asking how the McGirt case may be helpful to Creek Nation in these issues. Okay, I'm going to start with that one. Okay. Um, with the McGirt. So um, I'm still kind of writing high. I mean, I had two amazing things happen during this pandemic and I keep pinching myself because everyone is struggling so hard. I mean, my tribe has lost like 20% of our fluent speakers to COVID, like 20% of our speakers. And we're talking about hundreds left, like our, our language is in grave danger. Um, and um, I know that COVID has hit communities so hard um, and our tribal communities, both on reservation and in urban settings as well. It's just been devastating. And um, so that's probably what I'll remember most about this year. Um, but we did win a case in July. 
Um, and I was awarded a Carnegie Fellowship in April. So um, I feel very fortunate and very privileged to be able to do this kind of work um, and want to check myself and my privilege as much as I can. Um, so McGirt was a case about whether or not our treaty still mattered. Um, we signed a treaty with the US government in 1866, right after the Civil War. And it's just been kind of sitting there. Um, nobody's really done anything with it. And um, it, it, the treaty that we were promised in 1866 still exists, um, but nobody was really operating, understanding that. And so the state of Oklahoma took over everything. The state of Oklahoma took over almost every piece of land in Oklahoma, whether it was a reservation or not. And just that became Oklahoma land as far as they were concerned. And it was actually a sex offender who won this case. So there was a sex offender uh, on our reservation, our 1866 reservation, who committed um, heinous acts against children. Uh, and he was prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma. Um, and he got over a thousand years. It's one of those just draconian sentences that doesn't have any like real value, right? So he had nothing to lose. So he just starts throwing out different ideas or his attorneys, you know, throwing out different ways to try to address um, uh, his sentence to get it reduced or get it thrown out or whatever. And so they went to this treaty and they said, um, if this treaty is still valid and it has not been broken or facilitated to be diminished, then it still exists. And so the Major Crimes Act is what should apply. And this man should be prosecuted in federal court and not in state court. So it's odd for a victim advocate and somebody who works for survivors to, you know, want to side with somebody who has done these kinds of very painful, uh, long-term harm uh, kinds of behaviors. Um, but we sided with him because we we said yes, the reservation still exists. Nobody has ever done anything to to change that. So we've got the tribe and the sex offender from the tribe fighting against the state of Oklahoma. And um, Neil Gorsuch was actually the person who wrote the opinion. And it's one of the most beautiful Indian law decisions that's ever been written. I mean, I, I wept. I still think I'm going to cry when I talk about it. But Neil Gorsuch said at the long end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. And he reads the treaty as a textualist, as a conservative justice, he read the treaty and he read all of the things Oklahoma claimed that violated the treaty and determined that it was a 5-4 decision, but determined that the treaty is still valid. Now, Congress can always change that. They can always pass a law saying we're going to demolish the reservation because we can. But for now, we have it. We have it back. And so we're fighting very, very hard to ensure that we have the capacity to patrol and, 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 and um, control and respond to crime within this big reservation that we haven't had and haven't operated under since the 19th century. So we're not, we don't have the staff right now, the manpower, right, to get all of that done. And so we're working very, very hard to make sure that our, our victory in that McGirt decision um, is an example for other tribes about you know, how we can gain land back that was stolen. Uh, and that's what happened in McGirt. So we're um, beefing up our sexual assault laws. We're making sure that we're talking about therapeutic interventions as opposed to punitive interventions um, and doing those kinds of things. So that's why McGirt matters so much. And I also filed a brief in that case. So um, it's always um, feels very good to win and then to win a, a case involving your own tribe is, is about as good as it gets. Um, so that's that story. And then there was another question before that, that I can't remember. Um, that question was asking, um, since in some tribes there were women's laws and the violation of those laws were decided by women or clan, uh, could you speak a little more about this and your thoughts about integrating traditional forms of government? Okay, yeah. Well, um, I don't know much about um, I haven't read much about women's laws and men's laws, but I know that there were gender specific laws and there were also gender specific language. You know, women talked different than men in some of our tribal um, languages. Um, so there was, a, there was a binary sort of set up there and certainly people could bridge the binary or be part of you know, um, um, uh, disrupting that, but uh, language and, and laws could be gendered. Um, so I don't know too much about 
uh, that. Um, but uh, there are many tribal nations that offer an alternative to their Western system. So um, there's sort of two parallel systems that are working. One is the more westernized court with a judge and a bailiff and attorneys and that kind of thing. And then there's other tribes. Or they also might have traditional people who still operate on sort of a, a ceremonial restorative principle um, that, that is also ongoing, um, that's been unbroken in some cases. And so what a lot of tribes will do is they will make that an option. Um, it, you know, a case may be initiated in Western court on the tribal lands, um, but if both parties agree to take their case out of the court and into a ceremonial uh, uh, resolution process that, that where attorneys are not even allowed, um, they can choose to do that. So that's one of the things that's kind of hybrid approach. Um, and a lot of tribes are thinking about let's enlarge that therapeutic approach and try to dis try to shrink the, the punitive approach. Um, and, and so that's what I've seen um, happen more often is the parallel systems. We have one more question from the chat and then um, we can start wrapping up. Um, this person is asking, uh, I'm thinking about how hypersexualized stereotypes of Native women have the power to influence the sexual violence against Native women. How might we move forward to address that, uh, address that the violence against women also stems from our dehumanization through these controlling images? Absolutely. I'm really glad you raised that. Um, that's another presentation that I do. <laughs> If you want to invite me back, I'll give you that talk too. Um, yeah, it's not funny. I, I tend to, I should have mentioned earlier that I tend to kind of giggle and laugh when things are painful. It's kind of a coping mechanism for me, but um, absolutely um, the images of native women, you ask an average American with no knowledge, never taught anything in high school. And you ask them who, who can you name a, a famous native woman, a famous native woman? What do you think they say most often? Pocahontas. Pocahontas. And Weedemo. No. Oh, well, maybe. Maybe well, Sacagawea. Sacagawea. Uh, yes, right. thanks. And and both of those historical figures, they're real, they were real people, you know. Um, and so um, but both were sort of being um, at, at the service to some extent of white men, right? And and that and, and that's how we know them. That's how we know the characters. And one thing that I noticed recently is that you know there's disney's got a not great so great track record of getting race right in its in its cartoons and movies so i guess with disney now i haven't no, i haven't dived into disney plus yet because i'm trying to afford hulu netflix and whatever else um but the um I guess the, the one thing I read the other day is that they've started to put disclaimers on some of the older movies like Peter Pan, which has a horrific scene, uh, racism against um, Native um, people and joking and mocking and all of that kind of thing. So apparently, and I haven't checked this out, I heard that they do not have a disclaimer on Pocahontas. So they've kind of tried to correct the, the, the history without taking the movies down and provide these disclaimers. They have disclaimers about anti-Black uh, images and their, their older movies and, and the like. Um, uh, and, and yet Pocahontas is presented in this film as wearing you know, a tiny little skirt with a good body and very beautiful and talks to the squirrels and stuff. And so, so that, that's problematic. Um, I'm also very interested in mascots and how mascots create you know, these, these hypersexualized versions of, of Native women. And um, uh, we got the Washington, that was another th good thing that happened during COVID is that we got Washington uh, to change the name of their, of their team. Um, and now I'm in Kansas, so I'm working on the Chiefs, um, which is not a popular thing to do. Um, we can have a lot of football fans in your life, but um, I think that plays a role. I think, yeah, I think generally in, in uh, both historically and contemporary native women are hypersexualized and seen as sort of open for men and open for white men in particular. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. I have learned a great deal this afternoon, as I'm sure everyone who came this afternoon has. 
Um, we want to be respectful of your time and um, kind of wrap things up here. Um, we, I didn't ask you earlier, but if you wouldn't mind staying on for just two minutes with myself and Makana. After, sure. Yeah. Um, sure. So, so thank you so much to everyone who came. Um, please, if you have not yet, I didn't mention it earlier, go to our website and there's a, a link over on the left-hand side that says stay informed. You can sign up for our listserv and our newsletter where this was advertised and we will have a lot more coming. Um, a few things this semester, we have Leanne Simpson coming in early March with the Sarah Doyle Center and we will have more programming this summer as well. So thanks to everyone who came, have a great afternoon, take care and we'll see you soon. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you everyone.